Good morning, I'm Anton Grutter from the Lean Institute Africa in Cape Town uh, and I'm here with Mr. Peter Duplessis, the past CEO of Atlantis Foundries. Uh, Peter is here to tell us a bit more about how they use machine learning to substantially improve uh, quality at Atlantis Foundries. Uh, so welcome Peter. Thank you. Uh, maybe we can start with uh, a little bit of uh, at, uh, background of Atlantis Foundries, what products you make and a little bit of the history. Okay. Atlantis Foundry um, is a spin-off of the old ADE, Atlantis Diesel Engines, which was an engine plant um, that was built in the late 70s. Um, when sanctions was lifted on the country, everybody could import engines and the Atlantis Diesel Engine brand died away. Atlantis Foundries was bought by Mercedes-Benz um, to continue to cast cylinder blocks for trucks. Um, Daimler has a foundry in Mannheim in Germany, which is right in the middle of the city. And with the severe env environmental laws in Germany, they didn't have an opportunity to expand. So they bought Atlantis Foundries to enable them to expand their foundry capacity. Um, so they were bought by Daimler in 1999 um, to make these engine block castings for trucks. Um, Atlantis Foundries exported all its engines um, to Detroit Diesel in the United States to the Daimler facilities in Mana. They also had some external um, customers, Perkins in the UK, Sangyong in South Korea, Cummins in the US. So everything was export. And therein lies part of the reason for the artificial intelligence work that we did. Okay. Uh, um, and so, can you explain to us why quality was so important? Being so far away from the, the customer that we served um, meant that if you, you have any quality problem detected at the machining operations um, in the US, England, Korea, or Germany, you could a whole pipeline that's potentially contaminated. And the sorting cost of looking for quality defects in this pipeline, which could be anything from six to eight weeks, if not longer, um, is enormous. And so that's why first time right quality was critical. Um, because of these long pipelines, quality cost was a significant number for us. And, and how did you try and address it before? We did all the classical um, quality tools, um, AD problem solving, statistical process control, um, control plans, process sheets. Um, so everything that traditional companies would do to reduce quality, but we reached a, a plateau because your feedback loop was so long. Right. Um, and the process is incredibly complicated. Um, there's many, many variables in the process and to find the patterns in those variables when you get to quite low reject levels is, is quite difficult. Okay, and, and so before you started with the machine learning, more or less what was the level of performance? So a benchmark foundry uh, making the parts that we make um, made was typically running between four and eight percent scrap in the plant itself and we were running about six and at the customer, you'd be running between 1% and 2% uh, scrap. That is world benchmark right, levels. Right. Um, and Atlantis Finance at that time, at the customer, was running about 1.5%. And then, as I said, 6% um, internally. So we were mid-range. Mid okay. Um, and, and then what made you decide we must try this machine learning thing? We wanted to predict which component will be defective after machining in the US or Germany and not ship it in the first place. Okay. Because your defect is a function of your process. So in your process there must be a pattern that can be recognized that says okay if the process is in a certain way this casting will be defective. Right. Now the defects we're talking about are below the surface of the casting when they do the actual machining operation. So you can't see them physically. Right and you can't find them with ultrasonic methods um, because of the just the sheer size and volume. Um, so we wanted to predict based on what the process was at that point in time 
will the spousing be scrapped or not? Okay. And at the end, we had a 70% success rate. So we would say, throw these 10 castings away. And we know seven were definitely scrapped. Right. We know we would throw three good ones away, but the cost associated was um, insignificant. Right. Um, because throwing away a casting in the US after all the value add, etc., is far more expensive. Right. Plus, we could eliminate sorting actions. Okay. Yes. So, okay, so then the decision was made to, to, to try machine learning. Um, I think, uh, how long ago was that? Uh, we started in um, about March 2017 right. with the, with the uh, machine learning. Um, we used Data Profit here in Cape Town. And we gave them 18 months worth of data right. um, of the process and of the quality results both internally and, and externally. Okay, and and uh, implementing it. I mean, having data is, is an achievement in itself. So maybe before the actual analysis, what what did you need to do to make it work? So what did we what did we do? We we didn't have to generate new data. We just took the data that we had on a daily basis. Okay, a lot of data that we never used. All right. Okay, and we gave it to them. The most difficult task is matching the data to the component you've made. Okay. Okay. Because for every component you make, you must have data. Right. And so we normally use time series. We check the process every half an hour or every 40 minutes or once a day. So traditionally your processes are time or process tests are time series, but you make a component every minute. Right. So we had to find ways to match the data to the components. Okay. The initial model, we gave them um, the data for 18 months and we used to make 700 components a day, so 700 truck engines, which means 700 trucks are built a day, which is an enormous number if you think about it. Right. So out of 180,000 um, truck engines that was built, we had perfectly matching data initially only about 7,000 blocks. Okay. So we use this data to, to build the first model. Right. The magic about it is every week, as you feed in more data, the algorithm learns again. Okay. And now you can also start to do your testing to match exact components. Okay. And that is quite um, critical for the process. To say when we make block number one, we must test all these parameters. When we make block number thirty, we test all these parameters. Not every thirty minutes randomly anymore. Right, right. So your testing methods need to change. So could you just briefly explain to the layperson you know, how does this magic black box thing work? Okay, there are various types of artificial intelligence or machine learning. There's supervised and unsupervised. Unsupervised is where um, the answer is not known. You just give it the raw data and mm. it finds the patterns in there. We did supervised learning where we told that the outcome is either it was a good block or it was a bad block. And this was the process parameters for the good blocks, this were the process parameters for the bad blocks. But we had at that point in time on the pilot 125 process variables. So you can imagine the amount of combinations you can get. Um, with 125 process parameters. Um, so the algorithm then basically used brute force just by calculating iterations and iterations until it gets closer and closer to the answer. There's a specific technique that they call it, but I just it slipped my mind, mm. that the, the, the um, AI people use. And they use also various statistical techniques. Right. Um, but the key component is the brute force. Just the amount of iterations of calculation that they can do to get to the answer. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, practically speaking, in terms of uh, you know the, the rest of the organisation and the people, were there issues? Yes, there were the non-believers, including me. <laughs> I was very very sceptical um, at the beginning um, because I asked the guy, should I explain you how the process works? And he said, no, just give us give us the data. And I was like, if you don't understand the process. No, it doesn't matter. Just give us the data. <laughs> so I was skeptical at first. Right. Um, some of the engineers were fearful of their jobs. 
this thing is going to replace us. Um, which is something I actually underestimated. I thought, okay, yeah, clever people, well educated, but yet they were fearful right. um, of the AI. And it took a while for people to start to understand it and, and use it. And right. we've had some spectacular, spectacular results. Okay. okay. Um, using the model and being able to match the process, we know that the AI prescribed, because I did two things, so I must maybe say that. I, well, first, I wanted to predict which block will be scrapped in the US, plus in the second phase, I said, okay, now tell me what must I do not to make it scrap in the first place. Right. So it went from predicting the scrap block to prescribing the process. Okay. So I took these 125 process parameters and calculated the best region for them all. And it meant that a lot of our process limits were squeezed significantly. Okay. And some of them were adjusted. Okay. And the combination of these two things allowed us in the um, third of third quarter, third fourth quarter of 2017 to achieve zero scrap in the Detroit diesel plant, the Cummins plant, and the Diamond plant in Mana for three months on a row. Wow. Zero defect. Um, that is just unheard of. Absolutely. Um, I've spoken recently um, to some of the guys and that trend is, is continuing. Um, they don't always achieve zero defect because the process parameters become so tight that the machines and the people can actually not achieve it all the time. So that's where our defects come from now is that we just cannot keep the process in that tight little window. Right. Um, and that is where people will always be important in this whole thing. People still have to look at this report and say, what do I need to do to this machine to enable it to achieve X, Y, and Z? Right. You can't tell the machine you must now do that. Um, machines are not that clever. Right. So I think this notion of AI will replace all humans is, is a fallacy. Okay. Maybe in a couple of centuries, maybe I'm wrong, but I think much, much later it will okay. happen. But with the machines we have today, you can't tell it now to on your own in that way. So um, the the results are spectacular. Um, uh, it's it's always nice to be able to see those kinds of results. But no doubt it, it it was a journey and had some challenges. So what advice would you give to people when they start talking about the industry 4.0? I think a lot of people are struggling with industry 4.0, what, what does it mean, what is it about, um, we've got data, let's do something. And for me that would be the wrong approach. The correct approach would be, what is the problem in my business that I want to eliminate? What is my biggest headache? And how can this additional tool help me to achieve that goal? And in my case it was, I wanted to prevent a scrap block in the US or Germany. And once I was able to predict which block would be scrapped, I said, okay, so how do I now not make that block scrap in the first place? Mm -hmm. So you must have a goal. It's something that you want to achieve. Um, but just doing industry 4.0 for the sake of it, I think you will waste your time. Right. You must have a goal. So this makes me think about quite often nowadays when one hears about beyond lean. Yeah. Um, what does that sound to you like? Is it for me? It is. What is your vision of what a lean is? Right. And in my mind, lean is streamlining your process, reducing waste, making it more repeatable, more efficient. Right. And AI for me is just another tool to enable you to do that. Okay. It is not the silver bullet. It's just another tool. One of the things I realized when I started to get more and more involved in it is how far we still have to go to achieve this utopia of the machines are going to do everything by themselves and the process will run itself and no people are involved. I think that's incredibly far away. Um, the human aspect is important because 
part of the process is also human influences which we cannot eliminate them. Um, if an operator doesn't follow the rules, you can have all the AI you want, it's still not going to work. Okay. Um, so for me it's not beyond lean, it is another tool for lean. So Peter, thank you very much, um, especially for sharing. Um, uh, it's always very good to get the, the real world experience and share it with uh, people out there. Thank you. It was my Thanks. pleasure. Bye then.